The Mini DSP 2x4 HD has been a game changer for many people, including myself, looking to get the best base possible out of their subwoofers. But on the software side, it's been pretty stagnant for years with the same usable, but admittedly, somewhat clunky interface. Just recently though, Mini DSP released their device console, updating their old software into something more modern and streamlined that hopefully makes for a better overall experience. So here I have the old version of the software open, the Mini DSP 2x4 HD version. And we'll just start kind of at the top here. So we have our file restore help IR remote here with the file. Basically you can load configuration. So you have a saved configuration from one of the four down here. You can also save any of the current configurations that you're on. You can restore the whole thing to factory default. So that will wipe everything and get you started over from scratch. And then you can just see the current config. So we probably don't need to go through all this stuff in super fine detail, but I wanted to point out that you have to go up here to access all of this stuff. Now I am in like the preview mode here, so I don't have the ability to connect to anything. I don't have anything connected to the system. So if I try, it's just going to time out and tell me it can't detect anything. Okay, we know. Well, we're just kind of using the preview mode here, template mode. I guess you can call it. So we also have our configuration selections, which is basically each mini DSP device, from my knowledge, has four different configs you can choose from. Very useful if you want to have a little bit more base, a little higher SPL level on your base. You can just load in one of these configs, having different house curves on each one. Moving on down, we have inputs and routing and the outputs tab. So basically you switch in between the two. You typically don't have to go back and forth a lot during the whole process, but you might find yourself, oh, I need to go back here for something. Oh, I might want to add like a little parametric EQ. Some people like to use base EQ here, which is basically a per movie EQ file. A little section here is actually missing because I don't have anything plugged in under the inputs normally the 2x4 HD, you'll see analog and toss link and maybe one other might be USB audio. I'm not 100% sure, but it's missing here because I just don't have anything plugged in. This is kind of where we tell the mini DSP where everything is getting routed, how we have it set up. So input one is the ABR output. So we can actually just name that ABR out. And then input two, we don't have anything. So we don't need anything even selected here. If we have four subs, we just want to push all of these buttons here and turn them all on. And hey, let's go ahead and rename. Oh wait, we can't. That's right. You actually have to come over to the outputs tab. Here is where you can rename all your subs. You have front left sub, front right, back left, and back right. So now if we go back to inputs and routing, you can see they're labeled here. The outputs tab, this is kind of where all the magic happens. This is where we have all our parametric EQs for each individual sub, crossovers. If you're using this for something like a 2.1 channel setup, so you have maybe a stereo input, you have a couple of powered speakers connected to this, or maybe an external amp for those speakers and subs, you could actually use this to set crossovers for your subs and fronts. So here we have basically all your standard stuff, volume control that goes in point one step, so a little bit more fine tuning than what's available on most subwoofers through their app or even on the dial knob. It's kind of hard to get that dial knob, you know, the old school kind of turn knob exactly where you need it. So it might be easier to set it maybe a little higher than just use this to dial it in. Parametric EQ, this is typically where you put in the biquad files or the EQ files that you save out of Remy Q Wizard. And to do that, you'd actually go over to the advanced tab and then you click on import and then you'd find that file. I don't have one here. That's how you would import it. And you would do that for each pair of subwoofers. So the front left and front right are paired together. And then the back left and back right, you do the same thing. You go to import, find that file, open it, and then it would load it in here. And here is where you would actually link this to other channels. So the popular method that I use and that I'm a fan of is you apply the same EQ to all of your subwoofer channels. Basically it's just one big EQ file after you get them aligned. So to do that, you would come up here, select channel, actually it doesn't tell you what this is even for, which would be nice to know, right? So you want to link this channel with say the front right. So now you hit link enabled and there you go. So now the front left and front right are linked together. And then you have to do the same thing for the back right and back left. We'll hit link, do the same thing. For the crossovers, again, you wanna make sure these are all bypassed. In the old video, for some reason, all of my crossovers, I think maybe in a previous firmware, these are actually already set to like here. So you had to go in and bypass it and then make sure that these were linked together too. 
So basically you only had to adjust it once and you did the same thing for the back left or back subs, just depending on how many subs you have, you have to run through this stuff. Now moving on down here, we have compressors and FIR filters. Most of the time I don't touch these. I think a lot of people using them for subs typically don't touch them either. So I'll just kind of leave those alone. And at the bottom we have all of the delay settings. So these are in 0 0.01 millisecond increments. So you can really fine tune it. So each one has their own. And then finally you can invert and mute each sub. One thing I do want to point out is I've had it the same screen size this whole time. This is on my MacBook Air. But you'll notice if I try to full screen this guy, we just get these big white areas over here. It's the same on a Windows computer. Full screen just leaves the window the same size and just adds these big white borders on the side. No real point in having a full screen mode, right? So now with that said, let's jump over to the new device console and check that out. In the new device console, we have template devices on the left and I'll point out something real quick. I actually have it on the system mode and the, the dark mode, but this actually has a few different light and dark modes. So for this video, I'm gonna leave it in dark mode. I just like the way that looks, but you also have a software update right in here so you can check it to see if there's a software update and it'll tell you if there is but mine is up to date. What I do want to mention is the device console does in fact take care of firmware updates going forward on these devices. So you never have to download the firmware manually anymore and use their firmware update tool. It's all done for you in the device console. That So that's pretty neat. You never have to worry about that. I'm gonna to go to template devices because again, I don't have anything hooked up and we'll go to two by four HD and you'll notice something right away. I'm in full screen mode pretty much. I'm actually could go in full screen mode completely. And this is taking up the whole screen now. I don't have those white borders. Even if I get out of full screen mode and wanna go back to something maybe smaller, it all scales within the program now. I know that's just like a small thing, but it's really awesome. Sorry, these meters are jumping up and down. That's just in template mode. I don't know why it does that, but uh, whatever. It's just kind of showing you that it works. I'm gonna go ahead and make this bigger again so we can kind of see it better. You'll notice we don't have separate tabs anymore. Everything is right here. The inputs and the outputs are on the same page. And that just makes it a lot easier to make adjustments right from the get-go. Now, if we kind of start where we did before, up in the file and edit section up top, everything is right here, basically. We have the reset functionality so we can reset all and this will just revert everything to the factory settings. And that will kick you out of this, but then we can just go back in and we're, we're good to go. So on the left here, we have all four of our configurations. What's really nice here, we didn't have this option in the old ones, we can actually rename this. So even if we wanted to rename it to config one, we can do that and now it'll update there. What's great is if you have different configurations, you say like, oh, this is my 75 dB flat right, for my subwoofers. So now I see immediately that's my 75 dB flat. You're not having to guess which config is the one that you want to select or which one does what. I know for me, I typically like to play around a little bit and have different configurations. I can now switch back and forth and label these in a way that makes sense to me. And I think that's just one really cool feature that we didn't have before. Moving on here, we have both the import and export. This is basically the load and save functionality. This is where you can import one of your config files, maybe from an old mini DSP. Maybe you just have a bunch of different configs that you saved over time that you wanna access. Then you can do that right here pretty easily. If we had a device connected, we can also see the firmware versions and everything right here. And then like I said before on the old one, I didn't have this option, but here you'll see I have a few different options for the input source and analog here is where I would suggest most of you select if you are using RCA cables, but you do have Toslink and USB. So that's pretty cool. Another uh, addition that I think might trip some people up is this master volume control. For some reason, it defaults to minus 41.5 dB. For most people, just bring it all the way back up to zero. That's fine. If you bring in one of those old config files, it will default to zero. So in my opinion, in that case, zero is the correct setting. Let's move on to the right side here. We have that combination of the inputs and routing and output tabs. Basically all the same functionality is here. So instead of having inputs and routing tab where we set all this up, we can just tell it, oh, okay, input one, this is our AVR out. Then we can just go in and select all of this. So we have those same four subwoofers hooked up to all four outputs of the mini DSP and now they're properly routed. And as we move down these tabs here, you can see that things are relatively the same. They're not in the same order that they were before. So remember gain was up top originally, now it's down here. But we do have the same 0.1 increments that we could adjust 
as before. So nothing has changed there. And then the delay, same thing. We still have those same increments that we had before of 0.01 and nothing has changed there. Just the overall layout of where things are. But what's great is before you notice they didn't actually have any labels. So if it's your first time using it, it might've been confusing because you're like, okay, well, which one is the gain and which one is the delay? Now you can easily see which one is which. Then we have the same things down here, invert, mute, and compressor. Again, I don't really use a compressor, but it's off by default. You can enable it here if you just click on it. And then up top, we have the FIR filters. Again, most people don't use those. But then if we click on the parametric EQ, this area looks a little different. Didn't look like this before on the old one. It just kind of had this blank canvas. We had nothing here. Basically, these are the 10 EQ bands that are available down here. Now you may notice though, if we go down how we would normally import a EQ file from Room EQ Wizard, that option is not there. There's a separate section now up top called menu. So if we back out real quick and I'll go ahead and just label the subwoofers, front left, front right, back left and back right. What I did notice is I can't tab between the different outputs like I could in the older software version. So what I mean by that is like if I label this front left, if I tab to the next thing, it, it goes to this, the AVR out. So back to the parametric EQ, we open up the menu here, and then you'll notice we have the load by quads file, which is the, basically the EQ file from Room EQ Wizard. And this is where all of the linking happens as well. And what I like about this, you can be in one output, but do all of this for, ev like for every output instead of having to, okay, I need to link this with the front right. Okay, we'll confirm it then go back out, go to the back left, do the same thing, blah, blah, blah. You kind of get where I'm going. The thing is you do this once. So you're in the front left parametric EQ, but you hit the menu, you've linked that one. Oh, guess what? I can just go ahead and select back left, link it with the back right, that's done. I don't have to do that again. I can actually load all the files from right here. So instead of, again, like before, we'll load the file, Again, I don't have one, but we can load it all from this menu here by just selecting the different one. So that does save a lot of time because you're not having to go back out and then go to this one over here, open the menu and then load by quads file. And the same thing applies to the crossover as well. So if we do the same thing, we could link the crossovers here all within the same menu without ever leaving this area. I really do like that. I wish that there was a way that we kind of maybe had easier access to this instead of just you know bringing up a menu it would be great to have the option to just keep the menu up all the time so anytime you go into one of these areas one of these parametric eqs or crossovers the menu is already up waiting for you you don't have to hit this button every single time because if you leave it open you back out you go back into it it's not open anymore that would be cool to just maybe even have a setting in the settings menu of the overall program to allow that to happen. Just basically remember the menu selection that you've made. I don't even know if that's possible, but that's something that I would really like to see. But overall, that's kind of like the just general overview of everything. Sorry if I bounced around a little bit. I really do like this new layout. I think it's a lot more sleek and streamlined than it was before. I've used it a couple times now and I really do think it's better in pretty much every way. There's a couple of little quirks that maybe need to be addressed here or there, but overall I think it's a, a huge improvement over the previous software. Now I did wanna mention that I did update the firmware and everything on my two x four HD with this, and I'll kind of throw some screen capture of that in right now. And it was a really simple process. I did have to update the firmware using their old firmware tool first because I was running really outdated firmware. I don't even remember what it was. Basically, I hadn't updated the firmware since when I got the mini DSP back in 2021. So it was relatively old, but I updated that. And then when I launched the device console, it recognized it right away. I clicked on it and said there was another DSP update. So there's a firmware update and then a DSP update and they're separate. But what's great is now it's all done through the device console, the firmware and the DSP updates. So you don't have to worry about kind of keeping track of when many DSP releases an update. They will let you know whenever you connect it and open up the device console. So that's really 
really nice. I think that was part of the reason I never updated the firmware originally, but now it's much easier for pretty much everyone. I really like what they've done on that side of the software. So no more guesswork in updating the firmware. Now I know you guys have been asking for something on the device console. A lot of you have actually requested that I rework or revamp my old mini DSP tutorial series completely with the new device console. And I was initially just going to make this type of video comparing the old software with the new device console because honestly, a lot of the same functionality, actually all the same functionality is in the new device console. Things are just a little different in terms of placement. But then for some reason, Mini DSP decided to remove the ability to download the old versions of the software from their website for whatever reason. So with that said, I will be doing a complete revision of my mini DSP tutorial series. I don't know exactly when I have a few things I need to take care of first in the next couple weeks, but I am working on that. Basically my goal there is to improve the overall experience for you guys to make it better, more streamlined, make it easier to follow. Not that it was super difficult to follow before, but I wanna make it as easy as possible for you guys to get up and running with the mini DSP. Be on the lookout for that. Again, I don't have an ETA for that video series. I hope I just can improve enough over the previous versions to make it worthwhile for you guys to follow the new versions as well. If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful in any way, feel free to give it a like and also make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Also, have you used the new device console for Mini DSP? What do you think of it? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Are you indifferent? Do you not really care? Let me know in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you in the next one.